little verse from Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. What lessons would I have loved to have learned earlier? One of the most fundamental is one that is based on the scripture reading we had earlier. But, but let me share you one or two, and they're all to do with the nature of love. I wish I'd learned earlier that love that really lasts is something that does things. One of our greatest battles in care for the family is to convince people that love is not just a feeling. I was sharing with some people yesterday. I told them that I go to a little cottage in West Wales to write. And a couple of summers ago, I'm walking on the beach, and the sun is shining, the sand is beautiful, the mountains are wonderful. I say to an old fisherman on the way back to the little cottage, it's idyllic, isn't it? He said, you should see it in January. I don't know if he was just grumpy or tired of tourists, but as I walked on the beach the next day, I felt the sun and the sea and the mountains whispered to me, would you love us in January? Shortly afterwards, I'm speaking at a friend's daughter's wedding. It is a perfect day. The sun is streaming through the stained glass of this old church. She looks incredible. The bride looks incredible. He looks about as good as he's ever going to look in life. And I listen as they make the vows, and I wonder if I dare say to them, what's on my heart? Dare I invade this perfect day? And then the vows do it for me. They dare to invade this perfect day with warnings of darker times that may come. She says, I will love you if we are healthy. And he says, but if we are sick. If we are wealthy, but if we are poor. The, dare, the vows say, darker days will come. The young couple do not believe that. They say it sincerely. They mean the vows, but they do not really know that those days will come. Will those vows ever be called in? Yes, they will. As surely as night follows day, they will be called in. And one of them at least is going to have to love not just because of, but in spite of, if their love is to last. Love is going to not just be a feeling, but to do things. We had the privilege of speaking in the House of Parliament recently about one of our programs. We go into hospitals. We run a one-hour relationship course with couples who are about to have a child. A lot of couples break up within the few years of the birth of a first child. And we're at the House of Parliament, and we're telling these MPs about this course. They are so bored, they can hardly keep their eyes open. And then I tell them this story, and as I do, I see these men and women, these parliamentarians, wake up. This is the story I tell them. I'm counseling a young couple. They're in their mid-twenties. She is cradling a little girl of six months old. And I say to this young man, why are you leaving your wife and your little girl? And he says, because I don't feel in love anymore. When, when we got married, I was so in love, but I don't feel like that. And I say, did nobody tell you that the feelings of love go up and down? Did nobody tell you sometimes you have to love not just with a heart, but with a will? Did nobody tell you that after the birth of a little one, sometimes it gets tough? Did nobody ever tell you about January love? And he says, no, nobody told me that. And I look at this little girl. She's six months old. And the first man in her life is about to walk out on her forever. And nobody told him that. And the Bible says to us time and time again, understand the nature of love. Understand the nature of love. Understand the nature of my love for you. God is love. This is the basic message. There are other messages, but God is love. He loves you. We are so used to earning love from teachers, from parents even, from each other. You will love me if I do well. It's almost impossible for us to believe we can be loved anyway. All over the world, I ask parents, what is the greatest gift a parent can give a child? And all of the world, from Bangkok to Borneo, from New York to Newark, and I've spoken to a million people in live events, I get the same answer. Love, love is the greatest gift. I think it's the right answer. But there is another gift. And if this gift is not given, a child will never believe they are loved. It's the gift of acceptance. I think of a mother now, she's 40 years old. She's slim, she's attractive, she looks half her age. And her daughter is 14, slightly overweight. And her daughter comes into the room, and in my presence, this woman says to her own daughter, you know what, Sarah? I'm 40, and you're 14. 
And then she prods her daughter's tubby stomach. And she says, and I'm in better shape than you. Does that mother love her child? Yes, she does. She would give her life for her. Does she accept her? No. And it will be hard for that child to believe she is loved. Can you and I love each other? Husbands, wives, children, friends, anyway, can we accept whether we are fat or thin or clever or a little slow, whether we're rich or poor, young or old, whether we have a disability, can we really love? Can you and I believe that God loves us like that? I can believe he loves me if I get my half hour quiet time in, and that's a good thing. I can believe he loves me if I get to all the meetings. Those are good things. I can believe he loves me if I pray for an hour or even 10 minutes. Those are good things. But can I believe he loves me anyway? I meet many believers, they're my age, they honestly don't believe that God loves them. I was speaking some years ago, at big event, Spring Harvest, three or four thousand people, I speak for three quarters of an hour. When I finish speaking, a man gets up and tells a story, it takes him two minutes to tell it. And the second he sat down, I knew if he told it at the beginning, I need never have spoken. That's pretty sobering for a preacher. This is the story he told that night. He said, I had a great relationship with my mum and my dad, but in his 80s, dad had a stroke, left him unable to speak. He said, that was hard, dad loved to, to talk to me. He said, one day I ring my mum and say, mum, I'm doing some business near your home, can I come and stay the night? Of course you can, son. And he said, it's 10 o'clock at night and we're drinking cocoa, and mum and I are speaking with great animation, but my dad can only smile at me. At about 11 o'clock, I go up, and they've given me the old bedroom I had when I was a boy. And he said, I'm lying there, and I can imagine a picture of a spitfire on the left-hand wall and a cricket bat are, are, are leaning against the right-hand wall. And I start to go off to sleep, and there's a knock on the door. A bit surprised by that, but I shall come in, and it's my dad. He comes and he looks at me, lying there. And he sees there's a hair in my eye, and he licks his finger and pushes it back across my forehead. And he tucks the bedclothes in around me and straightens the top sheet, as he used to when I was a little boy. And he leans over me. He can't say anything, but he kisses me, smiles, and leaves. And he said, I am lying there. And I'm 45 years of age. And I got kids of my own, and I employ people. And I have just been tucked into bed by my own father. And boy, didn't it feel good. And Jeff looked out at 4,000 people and said, God is your father. Ladies and gentlemen, can you believe that this morning? You are loved. Nothing you do can make him love you more. Nothing you do can make him love you less. Don't take that for granted. Max Lucado put it well. It is true that God loves you anyway. He loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. Don't take it for granted. Let this spur you towards holy living. Not cheap grace, but you are loved. Sir, you are loved. Madam, God loves you. Sir, God loves you. You are loved. Some of you are going through tough times in your life, aren't you? And you know, sometimes in our Christian culture, we so are used to earning love. We believe if we're going through tough times, God does not love us. I've got two kids. My little darling Katie was the compliant one. She was first. That's what lures you into heaven the second. You think you're a great parent, but... You just got lucky, that's the truth of it. And then Lloyd came along, I've told some people yesterday, Lloyd came into the world smoking a cigar. <laughs> that little boy used to wake up every day of his young life with the same prayer on those tiny lips, dear God, help me drive my mother crazy today. And every day God answered his prayer. <laughs> he's got three little ones now, and, and Katie's got two. Little Harry, he's five now, and Jackson, just about uh, 18 months. And on a Tuesday in September, Katie went into hospital last autumn to have a very routine kidney operation. Very routine, just in for the night, and, and it went wrong. Over the next four weeks, Katie's life hung in the balance. Peritonitis set in. They opened my darling girl up twice. Suspected heart attack, blood transfusions. The night before she went in to hospital, uh, Di went in for a hip replacement because it was only meant to be a routine thing with Katie, otherwise she would have never have done it. 
Little Jackson with grandparents in West Wales, Paul looking after Harry, and they'd let me be there long nights with Katie often. I, it would be midnight, I'd be holding her hand, she'd have tubes coming out of every part of her body. And I can remember being there one night in the darkness. Katie was born in that hospital by Caesar section. I, I, I desperately wanted a boy, and I remember waiting outside the, the operating theater, and, and the midwife came out. I heard a baby cry. She said, Mr. Parsons, you've got a beautiful baby daughter. And my heart sank. And then she pulled the blanket back, and I looked into Katie's eyes, and I fell in love. And I have been in love ever since. Same hospital, but now I wave as she goes into the theater for the second time, and she gives me a tentative wave. And all the years have gone by, still trying to be a dad, and one night I'm sat by her bed and I'm holding her hand. And she, she wakes up. And she said, Daddy, I, I was woke up and you were just holding my hand. I said, did you hear what I said to you? She said, no. I said, Talitha Kumai. Do you know what that means? She said, no. I said, it's what Jesus said to Jairus' daughter. Little girl, get up. And I'm in the darkness there. And I, I've ministered for 50 years of my life in Christian ministry. And I think it all comes down to this. Do I trust God? I don't mean trust God to make Katie well. I know he could do that. I mean, do I trust him anyway? When life is good, I can believe he loves me. But what if life is not good, as life is not good for some of you? Your kids are breaking your heart, some of you. You're in financial trouble. Your marriage is going through a tough time. You've just discovered the cancer. Can you believe he loves you? We are so conditioned to think only when love is, life is good that he loves us. Do I trust him now? And you know what? It was almost a surprise to me. I discovered I did. I did. Shortly afterwards... I was speaking at our away day in Care for the Family, and they sang that lovely worship song you sang a moment ago. And it has the phrase in it, we have an anchor that holds within the veil. And I began talking uh, about that. My anchor holds within the veil. And I said to them for just two or three minutes, you know the important thing about a ship is not necessarily the size of an anchor, but where it's lodged. Our anchor in the storms is lodged in the very holiness of God, in the very presence of God. And we had a very bright woman, a, an academic from London. She was just visiting us, and she texted me the next day. She said, Rob, I'd have traveled from London 600 round miles just to hear you talk about that, the anchor of God. Katie's in hospital at this time, Di's still in hospital, and on the Saturday, I take my little uh, son, uh, my grandson, Harry, to the cinema. And it's one of these big complexes. And I'm holding his hand, and as we go into the complex, Harry starts singing. He was only four then. He starts singing. And I say, Harry, where did you learn that? He said, I don't know. I said, would you sing it again for Pops? He said, I will. Uh, we'll, we'll show you now. P perhaps we can have the lights out again. We'll, we'll show you again what happened in that uh, cinema complex that day. Some of it gets into kind of tongues in the middle. Sorry. His mum's in hospital fighting for her life, and his grandfather's in front of him, and a four-year-old boy is ministering to me, and there are tears streaming down my face. 
and I say in my heart, God, you love me. You love me in the good times, but bad things sometimes happen to good people. You love me anyway, and I thank you for that. And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, we are called to love others. Let me read you these remarkable words at the beginning of John uh, uh, 13. Incredible uh, words. And Jesus, here, here, here we go. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own away in the world. Here at last is a man with nothing to prove. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. He had nothing to prove. And therefore, the most remarkable thing happened on that night before he died. Within 24 hours, he was dead and buried. He gets up and he washes their feet. And he says, do you see what I've just done for you? I am your Lord and Master. You must wash each other's feet. And then that same evening, he says, you must love each other. Because you and I have been loved like that, we must love each other. You and I are called to love each other. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Nobody has told me about your church. All I know is uh, uh, that Peter and Sean are ministering here. You can, you've got a new building coming up, but I know nothing about it. Literally nothing. I don't know whether you're having a great time or a bad time, but I'm telling you this. Somebody told me years ago when I brought the prodigal's message. They said this. When the father's house is filled with the father's love, the prodigals will come home. And if this church is not filled with love, there's no point building a new place. You can have the biggest building in the world, but if you don't love each other, there's no point. You must love each other. Not just love people like you. Not who love worshipping like you or like being like you or dressing, but love those you don't naturally love. Jesus said, invite your enemies to your parties. We must forgive each other. I remember Dr. Artie Kendall, he genuinely is a dear friend of mine. If you look in front of most of his books, somewhere you'll catch my name. For some reason he sends me the manuscripts to read, I don't know why. Uh, uh, he's a dear friend. I can remember him telling me, he said, Rob, I'm in Westminster Chapel, I've been there a quarter of a century, and it's as if one day all hell breaks loose. And he said, I'm at the lowest moment of my life, and an old Romanian pastor, Joseph Ton, comes to visit. And I say, Joseph, I want to tell you what it's like in church, and I want to tell you what they're doing to me. And he says, he listens to me for an hour, and then he points a bony finger in my face. And he says, RT, you must totally forgive them. Until you do, you will be in chains. Hang on a second, there's some other stuff I forgot to tell you they did to me. RT, you must totally forgive them. Until you do, you will be in chains. This is what we are called to. To love each other. All over the world, churches are fighting and splitting. Listen, they... I was at a big event the other day, not too long ago, and I meet this pastor, and we begin to speak a thousand miles from my home. I said, how's life? He said, not good. The church is going through trouble. I said, I'll tell you what it's about. He said, you've never been to my church. I said, I can tell you what it's about. I've spoken to thousands of leaders across the world. It's about the style of worship, the style of leadership, the youth work, or the building. He said, how do you know that? <laughs> I said, I can tell you more than that. There's a group of people on a Sunday morning. They come and say, Pastor, lots of us are worried about this or that. And you say, who are they? Give me names. Can't give you names. That's going all over the world. Churches fighting and splitting. They're fighting over the color of the carpet, let alone anything else. Don't do it. Better to meet in a telephone kiosk. Love each other. Give way. No big deal. It must not fight over that. Listen, you can have the church of your dreams. You can have the worship you want and the building you want and the youth work you want. You can have it all. The only problem is your prodigals won't come home. Love each other. And you and I are called to love the community. Do we really want to love the community? I'll tell you, if we do, church is going to get a little rougher at the edges. I was speaking to the church just outside Colorado Springs. The pastor told me a lovely story. He said, Rob, he said, we, we're a prodigal-friendly church. It has grown from... 300 to 10,000 by welcoming the prodigals, but it gets a bit rough at the edges when you do that. Church is not quite so respectable. And he said a hell's angel was dead to come to our church. He was 25 years old. He had long, greasy hair. He had enough ironmonger in his face to open a small hardware shop. 
On these knuckles, he had an expletive. I won't spell it out, but four letters, and on these knuckles, Y-O-U. That was his statement to the world. And somebody dared him to come to church. He said, and he not only came to church, he walked right down the front and sat in the front row in front of the pulpit. He said, unfortunately for him, our church allocates certain seats to certain people to welcome. And he got himself in Marge Staples' area. Marge is almost 90 years old. Marge doesn't much care, frankly, these days whether we worship swinging from the chandeliers or using the old green hymn book. She doesn't care whether the building committee built it this way around or that way around, and she certainly doesn't care whether the carpets are blue or gray. She's going to be in front of Jesus any day now. She just wants to love people. And she says, oh, young man, come here. It's so lovely to see you in church. Let me hug you. And she holds him, and as she holds him, she feels the metal pressing in her face, and then she feels something else because he is crying. He doesn't stop crying until the preacher finished speaking. Gives his life to Christ that night. Six weeks later, a consultant plastic surgeon in that church gave him a skin graft to remove the tattoo. Frankly, he had to because the kid was offending people as he was worshipping. <laughs> when they baptized him, the wounds hadn't quite healed and he had little plastic bags over his wrist with rubber bands as he went under the water. I want the spirit of March Staples. As I get older, I want to care less about the stuff. The stuff. And I want to love people. I want to begin to try and love my enemies, those who've hurt me and I don't get on with, because one day I'll be front of him, him. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to love God like that. That's why I asked, that's why I asked Sean to read that incredible passage from, 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 from Corinthians. You know, this is, not, this is not life, easy life. Listen to it. This is somebody in the center of God's will. Listen what life is like for this person in the center of God's will. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are hard pressed but not crushed. We are struck down but not destroyed. We almost carry around in our body the marks of Jesus. This is somebody in the heart of God's will. Don't give me that junk about if you follow Jesus, life's going to be fine and I'll be wealthy or healthy. Can you and I love God in those times when we don't get all we want? Some time ago in Care for the Family, we took away about 60 people who have kids with very challenging situations. These kids are on drugs. They have emotional or physical challenges, um, many, many different things. And, and we took them away for the weekend. I couldn't be with them on the Friday night. I joined them on the Saturday night. I go in, they're singing a hymn. I, I come to the back row, I've got a message in my pocket. And a woman in front of me sinks to the chair and begins to cry. Then she rushes out, I go out after her. I say, how can I help you? She said, I'm not sure you can. My son was a drug addict and one night the dealers caught him and set him on fire. He wants men to give evidence in court against it. I begged him not to go to court, but he insisted on going, but he didn't turn up in court. And the police came looking for him and I found him dead in a squat. Two men were seen running from the squad. The police are trying to work out, whether well, was he murdered? Did he overdose accidentally? Or, or, or did he take his life? She said, I think he was murdered. I pray with her. I go back in. I, I take my seat in the front. By now, a young woman is speaking. She's about 28 years old. She had my husband and I so wanted children. And then I became pregnant. And my little girl was born. She, she has Down syndrome. And then after she was born, my husband contracted cancer and he died. My little girl is six years old now. And the other day I'm in the garden and there's some people coming to, 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 to see me and my friend is ill and we're praying for my friend to be made well in my garden. And suddenly my little girl comes out and she puts one hand on my friend's arm and one hand in the air and she begins to pray for my friend to be well. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm sat there, I got this message in my pocket and it doesn't seem anything like as good as when I prepared it. And I think, what on earth can I say to these people? And then it comes to me and this is what I say. Some of you have disabled children, don't you? And they say, yes, we have children with a disability. And you wish they were well, don't you? And they nod again. But you love them anyway, don't you? And they nod again. And I think they thought I was about to say, that's how God loves you, but I didn't say that. I said, that's how you love God. You don't love God because everything in the garden's rosy. You love him anyway. And although your love may seem faint and poor, do you see how precious it is? Because you love him against the odds. I hear Christians saying, God's blessed my home, my business, my church. Isn't God good? Yes. Enjoy those times, but that's not the test. 
The test is when you say with an old prophet, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, and there are no sheep in the stall, still will I rejoice in you. That's the test. Can you love him anyway? And I know some of you are going through tough times, and I know your hearts are breaking, and sometimes you hardly feel like followers of Jesus because life is so tough, but you are hanging on. Do you see how precious that is to him? Do you? How precious it is to him. Dear brothers and sisters, God loves you. Love each other. Let each other off the hook. Forgive as much as you can. Love him. And therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And our light and momentary trouble is achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on things which are seen, but on things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen will last forever. I'll be there afterwards if you want to come and see us about care for the family, but as I go, I want to tell you a little story and I want you to remember it. As you build your building, as you try to reach the community, it is of Isaac Pillman, the great violinist. Here's the deal when Pillman comes to play at your concert. The audience are in place, and the conductor's in place. And Pillman, who contracted polio when he was eight years old, comes on stage with a caliper on his leg, and he takes his seat to play solo violin, and he removes the caliper. And on this occasion, it is Pillman they have come to listen to. Because at the end of the piece, there's a very difficult six-minute violin solo, very difficult. 30 seconds into that violin solo, one of Pillman's four strings breaks. It sounds like a bullet ricocheting around the auditorium. The conductor drops his baton. The orchestra stops playing. The audience gasps. And then Pillman waves them to carry on. And for the next five and a half minutes, brilliantly transposing the music from four strings to three. He finishes the piece. And when he does, the sweat is pouring off his brow, and in the auditorium for 10 seconds, there is total silence. And then people go crazy. They're standing on the seats. The audience is standing, banging their, banging their seats. The, the orchestra are, are clapping. And then Perlman calls for silence on a microphone. And when they give it to him, he shouts the same thing twice into the darkness of the auditorium. All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. None of us can do anything about yesterday, but you and I in our lives, in this church, and in this community, and in our families, and amongst our friends, can make music from what remains. God bless you. Don't lose heart.